What if you could have a career where the opportunities are as vast as our nation, where it's not about mission statements, but a shared mission? At U.S. Customs and Border Protection, we go beyond to protect more than borders, from ship to shore, air to ground, cities to local communities. CBP agents and officers are keeping people safe. Join U.S. Customs and Border Protection and go beyond for something far greater than yourself. Learn more at cbp.gov careers. Hi, this is Scott. If you're a fan of the ancient world, please help us get the word out. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and rate the series on iTunes. Thanks again for listening. The Ancient World Bloodline, Episode B10 in Sorgo. Germanicus aside, the news for 19 AD wasn't entirely bleak. Tiberius' son Drusus and daughter in law Lavilla welcomed the rare birth of twin sons, named Tiberius Gamellus and Tiberius Gamellus which I was going to make a joke about, but then I found out that one of them only lived to age four, which is really sad. But back on the brighter side, word also came of the death of the German prince Arminius. The destroyer of Varus's legions and great nemesis of Germanicus had finally been done in by locals, who'd grown tired of his high-flying ambitions. Normally, both events would have merited celebrations in Rome, but for the moment, all eyes remained fixed on the approaching ship and its grim cargo. When Agrippina put in at Brundisium, when she first set foot on shore, eyes cast downward, clinging tightly to her husband's ashes, young children in tow, it was almost more than the assembled masses could bear. They'd gathered by the thousands to pay their respects, mostly common citizens, but also close friends. There was also a large group of soldiers who'd served under Germanicus east of the Rhine. As Agrippina walked past, the silence was only broken by sobs and groans of misery. Two cohorts of the Praetorian Guard, nearly a thousand men, had been sent by Tiberius as an escort. As the procession made its way north, regional magistrates performed civic honors, local nobles held funeral rites, and Germanicus's ashes were carried on the shoulders of centurions and tribunes. Tiberius's son Drusus arrived from Rome, bringing Germanicus's brother, the 29-year-old Claudius. Closer to the capital, the party was met by both Roman consuls and most of the Senate, who'd been busy awarding Germanicus posthumous honors. Every tribute Rome could offer was freely given. For those who'd known him, it would never be enough. In a large public ceremony, Germanicus's ashes were consigned to the Augustan Mausoleum. The official period of mourning was soon concluded, but that was only a formality. For those who knew the truth, justice could only come with the conviction of his murderer. On this front, there was a promising development. After expelling Gnaeus Calpurnius Piso, the new Roman governor of Syria, Gnaeus Sentius, had learned that an Antiochene named Martina, an expert in poisons, had been well acquainted with Piso's wife, Plancina. Sentius promptly seized Martina and dispatched her to Rome to serve as a witness in Piso's trial. She made it as far as Brundisium before dying of poison herself. A short time later, Piso arrived in the capital and settled into his mansion overlooking the forum. Charges were quickly brought against him, corrupting the legions, disobeying a superior, abandoning his province, then trying to retake it by force, and, lastly, the murder of Germanicus by poison. The case would be heard by the Senate and overseen by Tiberius. 
According to Tacitus, the prosecution came out swinging, calling Piso a lover of anarchy who'd used poison and the black arts to destroy Germanicus, then waged an armed assault on the Republic. It soon became clear that as far as bribing soldiers, disobeying Germanicus, and fighting Sentius, Piso didn't have much of a leg to stand on. It was only the crime of murder that demanded more evidence. Piso requested that all slaves who'd served food to Germanicus be tortured, to confirm that Piso never colluded with any of them to poison his meals. Fortunately for the servants, the Senate refused his request. Things were quickly going from bad to worse. Piso's war to retake Syria had cost him Tiberius' sympathy, and the Senate hadn't had much to begin with. But the biggest surprise came when Piso's wife Plancina cut a side deal with Livia for immunity, then started distancing herself from her husband with alarming speed. After his second day of public interrogation, Piso returned home, prepared some notes for his defense, passed them to a freedman, and retired. The next morning, he was found with his throat cut and the sword lying nearby. It was both justice and the denial of justice. Upon hearing the news, the Senate redirected their anger against Piso's relatives, moving to strip them of all offices, confiscate their property, and strike their family name from all official records. Tiberius blocked all these actions. The only Senate motion he approved was one thanking the brave souls who'd stood up to avenge Germanicus. His widow Agrippina, of course, his mother Antonia Minor, and Tiberius's son Drusus. Rounding out the list, Tiberius and his mother Livia. Oh, and later, when they'd realized they'd forgotten him, they added Germanicus's brother Claudius. Don't feel too bad. Claudius was pretty used to being left out. In the trial's aftermath, Agrippina settled her family on the Palatine Hill, where her six children were jointly raised by her, Antonia Minor, and Livia. Her life had been shattered, but she obeyed her husband's last request not to directly accuse Tiberius, if only for the sake of her children. That said, she was still Octavian's granddaughter, and would use whatever power she had to oppose Tiberius's rule and make sure one of her own sons succeeded him. Juba and Ptolemy must have learned the sad news from family, friends, and contacts back in Rome. Juba never met Germanicus, though he'd grown up alongside both his parents. As tragic as the whole affair was, Juba likely assumed that Piso's trial and death closed the matter. Ptolemy, however, had known Germanicus well, having spent six years in Rome living with Antonius' family. If he was tempted to believe the rumors about Tiberius' involvement, it's doubtful he could share them with his father. Tiberius was Juba's friend, foster brother, and emperor. To accuse him of such a horrific crime would have been unthinkable. Still, Ptolemy must have felt deep regret that he couldn't return to Rome for the funeral. Unfortunately, the situation in Mauritania would have made such a journey impossible. By 19 AD, the rebellion of the Gaetulian rebel Tacfarinus had both resumed and intensified. And this time, it wasn't only costing the lives of soldiers and citizens on the frontier. The unrest was also disrupting agricultural production, savaging the North African economy and leading to grain shortages back in Rome. Tiberius was under mounting pressure to bring the situation under control, a pressure keenly felt by the new African proconsul Lucius Apronius, as well as the 67-year-old King Juba II of Mauritania. While Tacfarinus mainly relied on sudden and devastating raids, he eventually grew bold enough to try a new tactic. 
In 19 AD, his forces laid siege to a Roman fort near the Pagida River, trapping a cohort of soldiers inside the walls. Their commander, an old-school, no-nonsense type named Decrius, considered the siege an insult to Roman honor. He addressed his men, drew them up outside the fort, and offered battle to the rebels. Unfortunately, they took him up on the offer. Now, don't get me wrong. Decrius was both experienced and brave. He even took an arrow in the chest and another in the eye and kept on fighting. But his troops were another story, and apparently broken ran after the first enemy wave. Decrius eventually went down fighting, attacking the Gaetulians and cursing his own men. And, oh yeah, with an arrow in his freaking eye, while his cohort watched impotently from the safety of the walls. After a while, the rebels either got tired and left, or the fort was relieved. Either way, Decrius aside, it was not a shining moment for the Republic. The African proconsul, Lucius Apronius, was horrified. And he also decided to go old school, very, very old school, and subject the cowardly cohort to decimation. What's decimation? I'm glad you asked. All of you are going to draw lots, and the 10% of you who get the short stick are going to be flogged to death while the others watch. Though insanely brutal, the tactic was apparently effective. When, a short time later, Tacfarinus attempted to besiege a second stronghold named Thala, the Roman soldiers were climbing over each other to get at the enemy. The cohort-sized force of veterans fought with such ferocity that not only were the rebels driven off, but Tacfarinus gave up using siege tactics for the rest of the war. Which didn't really help the Romans much, since he just returned to the tactics that had already proven so effective. Lightning raids and wanton devastation. The funny part was, Tacfarinus became so successful that it actually started working against him. The sheer volume of plunder forced him to establish a fixed encampment near the coast. Once the location was discovered, Apronius sent his son, Lucius Apronius Caianus, with cavalry, auxiliaries, and his most mobile infantry to attack the rebel base. The assault was successful, and the Gaetulians were forced to flee back to the desert. The end of Tacfarinus? Not hardly. But Apronius did get a triumph, which is always nice. So, how do we know that the Mauritanians also saw some action? I hate to sound like a broken record, but yes, Juba issued another series of victory coins. And I can only assume if you collect them all, you can enter a drawing for some valuable prizes. Or something. Anyway, by this time, the armed forces of the kingdom were almost certainly being led by his son and co-ruler, Ptolemy. Back in Rome, Tiberius and Drusus had assumed a similar dynamic. In 21 AD, after governing Illyricum for four years, Drusus assumed his second consulship alongside his father. Tiberius then decided to spend a big chunk of the year in Campania. While his plan was pitched as giving Drusus some valuable on-the-job training for his future role as emperor, it had the added benefit of letting Tiberius escape the duties and pressures of everyday life in Rome. And then sometimes things came up demanding Tiberius' personal attention. Like, oh, I don't know. Maybe when Tacfarinus sent an embassy to Rome, threatening to resume hostilities unless he was granted African lands for himself and his army. According to Tacitus, by all accounts, no insult to himself and the nation ever stung the emperor more than the spectacle of a deserter and bandit aping the procedure of an unfriendly power. This, this Tiberius would make time for. As the new African proconsul, Tiberius chose Quintus Junius Blazus. 
While he was an experienced commander, Blazes's main qualification was that his nephew was Tiberius's right-hand man, the Praetorian prefect Sejanus. Blazes was dispatched to Africa along with an additional legion and associated auxiliaries, bringing total African forces up to around 20,000 troops. His sole mandate was to deal with Tacfarinas once and for all. Blazes began his campaign by offering amnesty to any rebels who put down arms. After four years of war, successful or otherwise, there were plenty of tribesmen ready to take him up on the offer. Next, Blazes decided to shift Roman tactics to match his opponent. He split his troops into three columns, one headed by him, another by his son, and a third under the legate Cornelius Scipio. Yes, you must always bring a Scipio with you to Africa. It's like an unwritten rule. One column was tasked with blocking the pass Tacfarinus used to retreat to the deserts of Garamantia. The second was ordered to secure the region around the old Numidian capital of Serta, and the third column was split up among dozens of forts and other strong points across the province, each commanded by a veteran centurion. The concept was that no matter where Tacfarinus turned up, he'd find Romans waiting, and no matter where he tried to flee, he'd find Romans blocking his path. It was a good plan. In addition, Blazes dispensed with the Roman custom of recalling his men to winter quarters, and instead kept the pressure on year-round. In fact, Roman troops began going on the offensive, tracking down and attacking rebel camps, and keeping Tacfarinas constantly on the run. Blazes' biggest victory came when he finally managed to capture Tacfarinas' brother, which, if not the leader himself, was still pretty significant. Since this happened near the end of his second African proconsulship, in 23 AD, Blazes decided to declare victory and return to Rome. Before he did, Tiberius permitted him a singular honor. Blazes' troops were allowed to hail him as Imperator. Now, traditionally, being hailed as Imperator wasn't the same thing as being declared Roman Emperor. It was mainly just a way to publicly recognize a successful campaign executed by a popular general. Multiple commanders could be hailed as Imperator at the same time, and it didn't really even confer any special privileges. It certainly did not mean that you immediately had to engage all other imperators in a bloody struggle for supremacy. No, all that fun came much later. For now, it was still just a nice honor. But either way, for you trivia buffs, this was the last time the title would be granted to anyone outside the imperial family. And, for you coin collectors, this was also the year that Juba issued his final set of Mauritanian victory coins. So get them now while supplies last. The previous year, Tiberius had also asked the Senate for additional honors for his son Drusus. This time, it was tribunician powers, the same powers Tiberius had been granted as Octavian's official heir. Despite his volatile temperament, Drusus was maturing into a respectable young man. I mean, sure, he still drank way too much, and was still too big a fan of gladiator fights. But he was also a victorious general, a talented administrator, and a devoted family man. Married for 19 years to Germanicus's sister Lavilla, and the father of three children— 19-year-old Julia, and his twin sons, Tiberius Gemellus and Tiberius Gemellus. Okay, maybe creativity wasn't his strong suit. His reputation had also been burnished by his vigor in pushing for Piso's prosecution, something done out of his deep love for his adopted brother. In the trial's aftermath, Drusus had also proven to be a constant friend to Germanicus's widow and children. His partnership with Tiberius was generally seamless, with one major exception. 
Drusus could not stand his father's right-hand man, the Praetorian prefect Sejanus. In fact, he openly despised him. In fact, during one argument, Drusus became so angry that he actually struck Sejanus across the face. And all that was only because he saw Sejanus for what he was, a highly dangerous, super-ambitious social climber who'd do anything to gain power. Just imagine how upset Drusus would have been if he knew that his wife Lavilla had been sleeping with Sejanus for years, that the twin boys were likely his, and that the two adulterers were even then making plans to have him killed. Tiberius had a huge blind spot in the matter of Sejanus, so he assumed the issue was a typical personality conflict and refused to take any action. But Sejanus knew that Tiberius, now 65 years old, wasn't going to live forever. He also knew that the very first act of the future emperor Drusus would be Sejanus's banishment or execution. The granting of tribunician powers was apparently the trigger for Sejanus to move up his timetable. He didn't pull a piso. The poison he administered was gradual and took on the appearance of the slow progress of a natural illness. In the end, neither Tiberius nor Drusus suspected a thing, right up to the moment that Drusus died. In public, at least, the passing of his only son hardly seemed to touch Tiberius. He kept right on attending meetings of the Senate, and even berated the consuls when they affected signs of mourning. In a short speech, Tiberius proposed that the two eldest sons of Germanicus, 17-year-old Nero and 16-year-old Drusus, be considered the future heirs of the empire. Maybe it was out of love for his long-lost brother Drusus, or a vestigial sense of duty to Octavian. Or maybe it was because Tiberius really had no backup plan. Either way, it only gave Sejanus more enemies to target. If Tiberius ever had any interest in actually governing, as opposed to just holding power, it quickly evaporated once he had no son to groom. After Drusus was interred in the Augustan mausoleum, Tiberius began to lean more and more on Sejanus to manage routine affairs of state, frequently calling him the partner of my labors. He had statues of Sejanus erected in the capital, appointed his friends and family to prominent posts, and gave him free reign in running what was essentially a 5,000-member strong internal security force. Ultimately, the partnership would result in years of bloody terror for both Octavian's family and the people of Rome. But all that was still a few years away. In Mauritania that same year came another great ending. King Juba II, only son of King Juba I of Numidia and descendant of the first Numidian king Massinissa, died. He was 71 years old and had ruled the kingdom of Mauritania for 48 long years, 20 of them alongside his wife and partner, Queen Cleopatra Selene. As a young boy in Numidia, Juba could have easily died as a casualty of Roman civil war. But instead, his fostering in the family of Julius Caesar had given him a long life full of adventure, exploration, scholarship, and, all too often, warfare. It's not recorded whether Juba fell in conflict against the Gaetulians, or, more likely, and more hopefully, in his bed, lost in thoughts of more peaceful days. Only his final resting place is known, alongside Cleopatra Selene in the Mauritanian Royal Mausoleum. Juba's memorial service was likely officiated by his son Ptolemy, and attended by family, friends, and dignitaries from Africa, Iberia, Rome, and other foreign lands. The great poet Cornagoras of Mytilene was long dead, so there'd be no epigram to mark his passing. 
And Strabo, Juba's old friend from his youth in Rome, was 86 years old and unable to make the journey. But still, at the time of his death, Juba was the longest reigning Roman client king of the largest Roman client kingdom, and a widely respected figure in both government and scholarship. His passing would not go unnoticed. And, in at least one quarter, the news was greeted with joy. Deep in the deserts of Gaetulia, Tacfarinus was reconstituting his army, drawing from the near-infinite pool of disgruntled nomads eager for plunder. With Juba dead, and Blazes having taken his second legion and returned to Rome, the time was clearly ripe for another major offensive. Only this time, the goal wouldn't just be land concessions, but the total expulsion of Roman influence from Africa and Mauritania, which very much included the new Mauritanian king, Ptolemy I. Ptolemy I. 